There was a poor young boy who was sensitive to spiritual things who desperately wanted a bicycle. His mom didn't have the money for a bike, but encouraged him to try praying. So that night before bed, he prayed, Dear Jesus, can you please give me a new bicycle? And I would like it on my porch by 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. The next morning, he woke up and rushed out to the porch, fully expecting a bike. And it wasn't there. Disappointed, he wondered what had gone wrong. Later that day, he heard a TV evangelist praying, and he thought to himself, I need to pray like that. So that night he prayed, I claim a new bike in the name of Jesus and believe by faith that it will be there by 7 in the morning. The next morning, full of anticipation, he rushed out to the porch and again, disappointment, no bike. Then he decided a very different type of prayer was needed. He went over to the neighbor's yard, took their small statue of Mary from the lawn and disappeared into the woods with a shovel. That night he prayed, Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again, there comes a time in our lives for most everyone when hard circumstances cause us to be desperate enough to call out to God for help, to pray. Sometimes it's a medical emergency, life and death. Sometimes it's a broken relationship that has caused so much hurt and pain. And sometimes it's a combination of stressors in life. Desperation often pushes people to prayer, even those who may not believe in a God or in prayer. Twenty years ago, my, life, my wife's water broke halfway through the pregnancy, and she went into labor. There was no hope for our child to survive at that age if, he, if she delivered. We were crushed, broken, desperate, and we and our family prayed. The labor stopped. Our son Daniel, who's now 20, miraculously lived in a dry womb for 14 more weeks, long enough to be able to survive birth. We prayed. God answered. 18 months later, Daniel contracted a severe virus at the same time as developing some vascular malformations of the brain that caused a brainstem injury. He slipped into a coma. Again, he went on life support, and we prayed he was medevaced to Children's Hospital Philadelphia for emergency brain surgery, and then he recovered. See, we were desperate, and we had called out to God for help, and God had answered. When desperation drives one to prayer, looking for a divine intervention, it makes you acutely aware of how much you need God to intervene. In one of the first person accounts of the ministry of Jesus, known as the Gospels, there's a historical account of a father who also was desperate for the life of his daughter. This account is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, starting in verse 18. It says, As Jesus was saying this, the leader of a synagogue came and knelt before him. My daughter has just died, he said, but you can bring her back to life again if you just come and lay your hand on her. So Jesus and his disciples got up and went with him. When Jesus arrived at the official's home, he saw the noisy crowd and heard the funeral music. Get out, he told them. The girl isn't dead. She's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him. After the crowd was put outside, however, Jesus went in and took the girl by the hand and she stood up. The report of this miracle swept through the entire countryside. Now, this story is an account of a desperate father who approaches Jesus asking for help. Like most stories, it has an intro, a climax, and a conclusion, and this one ends well. However, I want to look at, the, at this story from a different perspective. This story provides a model of prayer for those who likewise are desperate and how they need God to intervene. Let's look at this model of prayer. In verse 18, it says, The leader of the synagogue came and knelt before him. What does it mean to come to Jesus? Someone who comes to Jesus is leaving somewhere else or maybe leaving something else or someone else. They might be leaving a place or a thing because it's not working for them. Or maybe they had nowhere else to turn to. Is there something not working for you in your life right now? Is there something you know needs changed and you have nowhere else to turn See, to come to Jesus involves recognition of a need, a self-statement that says, I need Jesus. And those who have a deeper prayer life, those that spend more time in prayer, know that the more you acknowledge that you need Jesus, the more you pray. There's a direct correlation between how much you acknowledge that you need Jesus 
and how much you pray. The question for you is how much do you need Jesus? The leader of the synagogue was facing the horror of death of a child. Despair, grief, feelings of helplessness, emptiness. He watched his child struggle to live and then die. And death was final, complete, the end. Was there any hope for his daughter to live again? Do you think he was desperate? He could not heal his, fa- his daughter, and he certainly could not fix death. He needed Jesus, so he came to Jesus. In his desperation, he remembered this teacher called Jesus, who he had heard healed the sick. But could he also raise the dead? The first step in prayer is coming to Jesus, acknowledging your need for Jesus and leaving something or somewhere behind. And what the Father did, and what did the Father do when he found Jesus? Verse 18 tells us he knelt before him. What's the attitude of the heart that kneeling before someone reflects? It ref- it's the attitude of respect and humility. It's recognizing that the person before you is greater than you. This desperate father had the respect and humility to pause long enough to kneel to Jesus before unloading his problems on Jesus. Now, of course, not everyone has the physical ability to kneel before Jesus when they pray. Old joints or other things may prevent that. I was humbled once recently when I stopped to visit an elderly lady and her son. At the end of the visit, I asked if I could pray with her, and she went and kneeled at the couch and looked over at me and said, Come on implying she expected me to kneel beside her. I did, and after we prayed together, I asked her if I could help her up, and she said, the good Lord got me down here, and he can get me back up. That humbled me. I need to be on my knees more. Kneeling before Jesus is a reflection of the heart. It doesn't have to be physical kneeling, but it does have to be a humble and respectful heart. The book of James chapter 4 verse 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The first step in prayer is coming to Jesus. The second step in prayer is kneeling your heart before him. The passage goes on to say that after he came to Jesus and knelt before him, he told Jesus, my daughter has just died. Can you imagine how hard it was for him to acknowledge that, to tell Jesus that? The third step in prayer is stating the problem exactly as you see it. Life is full of problems. There's no denying that. We are really good at being critical and identifying problems. Do you think this father might have been emotional when he told Jesus about his daughter? Maybe his voice cracked as he was speaking, or he forced the words out through sobs. My daughter is dead. God wants us to tell our problems and how we feel about them, and with all the emotions. But why is that important to tell God? Doesn't he already know? There are a couple answers to that. One is because he desires a relationship with us and wants us to express our feelings, raw, unfiltered, however it comes out, more like typical conversations we experience with others that we're close to. And sometimes God answers our prayers by changing how we view the problem. Some of my son's disabilities are significant. And when he was young, we prayed earnestly for healing. God did heal my son, and in some areas and others, he didn't. But what he did heal was our perspective. We learned and continue to see that God uses our son's disabilities to bring joy into people's lives, which brings God glory. What I saw was the problem God uses for his good. The synagogue leader came to Jesus knelt before him, stated the problem exactly as he saw it, and then he did something very amazing. He tells Jesus how he thinks Jesus could fix it. He says to Jesus, but can you bring her back, but you can bring her back to life again if you just come and lay your hands on her. Is that presumptuous? Arrogant? Telling God how you think the problem can be fixed? No, it expresses your faith. Philippians 4, 6 says, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Ephesians 3, 20 says, now all glory to God, who's able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. God wants us to ask and specifically tell him how we think the problem can be resolved. 
He gives permission to ask. He's going to answer according to his sovereignty and perfect love, meaning he will do what we ask or he will do better because he loves us. What father does not want to do best for his children? The challenge for our hearts is to recognize that his better is best. Several years ago, I was on a missions trip to the Dominican Republic, and typical for me, I got travel sickness, the type that makes you not wander far from a toilet. I prayed that God would take it from me so that I could do what I thought I had come to do, and God didn't. I argued with God, God, what's up here? I know you sent me here to share your love. Why am I sick And why haven't you healed me? God said in my heart, challenging my entitlements, are you above getting sick, Dwayne? And then he said, and how much have you suffered for the gospel? And then he said in my heart, I'm calling you to a ministry of prayer for your team that's out working with the people. So while I was tied to a bathroom at the mission house, I repented of my entitlements and I prayed for the team that was out on the streets. God's better was best. His perfect love and perfect sovereignty had a better plan. Now back to our story in Matthew chapter 9. It says, so Jesus and his disciples got up and went with him. Let me point out here that there's a time lapse between when the father asked Jesus to heal his daughter and when the healing actually happens. It didn't say right away they had to go on to the father's house where the daughter was. We don't know how far away that was. And on the way, Jesus encounters a woman who had a bleeding disorder, who also was desperate, who also had humbled herself before Jesus, and he stops and heals her. That's verses 20 through 22. All of that, the travel, the stopping to heal someone, that would have taken time, time between the request and Jesus' answer. Now this father had just lost his daughter and was desperate Do you think he might have been impatient with Jesus? Jesus, what are you doing? You're going too slow, and now you're stopping to help someone else? This woman's alive. My daughter is dead. Are you ever impatient with God, waiting for his answers? Do you ever critique God on his timing? The fifth step in prayer from this story is waiting in faith. I don't like waiting. How about you? We don't know how God will answer our prayers or when, but what we do know is that because of his unfailing love, the how he answers our prayers and when he answers our prayers will be the perfect solution at exactly the right time. This father came to Jesus. He knelt before him. He told Jesus the problem. He told Jesus a solution from his perspective, and then he waited. And look what happened next. Verse 23 says, Jesus arrived at the official's home and he saw the noisy crowd and he heard the funeral music. So this noisy crowd and funeral music was part of ancient Middle Eastern culture of grieving prior to a funeral, prior to the the burial. It would have added considerable emotion and intensity to the scene. And it provides further evidence emphasizing that this little girl was really dead. Can you imagine how seeing the crowd and hearing the funeral music made the father feel? And then knowing that when he arrived back at the house, he was going to see his daughter lying there dead. Yet he was not alone facing his daughter's death. He had brought Jesus with him. Look, if you're facing a a desperate situation in life, wouldn't it be best to bring Jesus along on that journey? And look what Jesus does in this story. Verse 24, he says, Get out, he told them. The girl isn't dead, she's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him. After the crowd was put outside, however, Jesus went in and took the girl by the hand, and she stood up. I smile when I read the part of the story that Jesus put the crowd outside. Crowd control always impresses me. I would have liked to have seen that happen. One person speaks and the crowd obeys. That's impressive. But what really impressed me is what happened next. It says Jesus took the girl by the hand and she stood up, not dead, alive, and standing before them. His daughter who was dead now standing before him. What did the father tell Jesus he thought the solution was? 
you can bring her back to life again if you just come and lay your hand on her. Jesus didn't just lay his hand on her. He took her by the hand and helped her stand up, up from the dead, alive. And she wasn't just alive, she was strong enough to stand. The horrifying problem of death was fixed for this little girl, and the solution was Jesus. And exactly what you think would happen when someone comes back to life happened. It says the report of this miracle swept through the entire countryside. How do you think that report swept through the countryside? Well, people that had been there, well, the people that had seen this happen, they told the story, and then they retold the story, and then those who heard the story told the story. They told how this little girl that was once dead was now alive, how a father had brought Jesus back because the daughter was alive, and Jesus had brought her back to life. The sixth step in prayer is telling others what Jesus has done in your life. Telling others about how Jesus resolved a situation that you were desperate about. The model of prayer from this passage starts with acknowledging, acknowledging how much you need God to intervene. Then coming to Jesus, kneeling your heart and mind before him, telling him exactly as you see the problem, telling him how you think he can fix it, then waiting in faith for him to respond. And when he does respond, telling others what God's response testifying of his love and his faithfulness. I don't know what you're facing in life right now. Maybe a broken relationship, a loss of income. Maybe your child is sick as well. Maybe you're empty and lonely inside and just don't want to be alone anymore. Maybe you know in your heart that where you are in life or what you are in life is not working for you right now. Are you desperate enough to pray? Jesus loves you and is just waiting for you to ask for help. Will you go to Jesus? Tell him your problem. Tell him how you think he can fix it and watch and wait for his response. There is one specific life and death problem that this model of prayer also addresses. God's word in Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Sin is an old word that means missing the mark or falling short of a target that we can never hit. This word in ancient days was used to describe archers who didn't hit the target. They missed. They sinned. What is the target, you might ask, that Romans 3.23 is talking about? What is the target that all of mankind falls short of? The God of the Bible is holy. You also could use the word perfect as in sinless. He is alone in that category different from us or separate from us as the word holy means in that we are not holy or perfect because we do sin. We miss God's mark, his standard of perfection, sinlessness. We fall short of that. You and I both know that we are not perfect. None of us are. The problem becomes more pronounced because God desires an eternal relationship with us, but our sin creates a barrier between us and him. Sinful man and holy God cannot be together. Sin is the barrier. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, meaning in the presence of a holy God, the payment for our sin or consequence of our sin is death, eternal death, final, complete, horrifying, eternal death. Just as death separated the father from the little girl, so does our sin separate us from God. And separation from God is eternal death. And unless our sin is accounted for by someone else, paid for by someone else, this eternal separation from God happens. Romans 6, 23 goes on to say, but, and this is a very significant but, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What this means is that God gives us fr a free gift to address this problem. And that gift is Jesus. Yes, the same Jesus who raised the little girl from the dead. He is God incarnate, God in the flesh. And because Jesus is God, he is sinless. He lives sinlessly. Jesus was willingly to pay for our sin himself through his own death. He died in our place so that we wouldn't have to. 
you won't find a better deal than this on the internet. He took our place in death so that we wouldn't have to die eternally. Jesus paid for our sin and thus fixed death so that we could have a relationship with God. So how can I have this eternal life with God through Jesus? You can use this same model of prayer. You acknowledge your need, that you can't fix death. You acknowledge that your sin separates you from God. Where you were, what you were doing was not working for you. So you turn away from that sin and you come to Jesus. That's called repenting or turning away from. The name Jesus is a contraction of the Hebrew words Yehovah and Shua. Put those together and you have Yeshua, the Hebrew name for Jesus, which means God is salvation. Jesus is salvation. You come to him, Jesus, because he is the only person who lived a sinless life. He alone is the one who could pay for other sins. His sinlessness made him the perfect sacrifice. Jesus alone saves. You then kneel your head and heart before him in humility and respect, acknowledging your need and his ability to remove your sin barrier between you and God and to fix the consequence of sin, which is death. You tell him the problem. You confess that you are in fact a sinner and that because you are Because of your sin, you deserve death. And then you ask him to fix it, to save you by his own death on the cross for you. And for this prayer, you don't have to wait. He saves you instantly. He takes your sin away and gives you his status before God of sinlessness, what the Bible calls righteous. And then because your sin is removed, the sin barrier between you and God is gone then God's spirit immediately comes to live inside you, giving you eternal life and eternal relationship with God. Holy God and sinful man, now together at last, just what God wanted. And God's spirit inside you makes you a new person. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone belongs to Christ, he is a new person. Then when you are ready, you tell. You tell your story, which is now God's story in your life. How he saved you from where you were and brought you to a new place and made you a new person. How he so much wanted a relationship with you that he paid for your sin with his own physical life. And you tell others about what life has been like for you since God entered your life. If you desire this eternal relationship with God, then pray this with me. Father God, I know that I'm a sinner, that my sin deserves death, I can't fix the sin problem in my life. I accept your forgiveness of my sin and put my faith and trust in Jesus who died on the cross in my place. I ask that by your spirit that now lives inside me that you help me live a life for your glory. Amen.